managing your career. You know, I did a, uh, a little informal survey of writers, some on the panel and some not, before this panel, and found that there was a real split between writers who feel that they actually have been able to manage their careers and the majority who feel like, you know, they have coasted along and serendipity and instinct and luck and um, desperation have played a large role. And one of the things that I want to do on this panel is demystify. You know, I know that you've heard a lot about how to break in and what spec script to write and so on and so forth. When you're actually doing it, you get confronted with, you know, with problems that may seem really stupid. <laughs> um, and I really want to encourage you, you know, when you're, when you're listening to this, to ask any question. You know, it's like we talked about how to act in the writer's room. And, you know, there may be a question that people have about, you know, what should I wear to work? <laughs> I mean, please, I want you to be very uncensored and, uh, you know, think about what you really want to know and we will keep you anonymous for all future purposes. Um, I would like to introduce each panelist as, as I ask them a question. I'd like to go start out asking each person a specific question and then we'll uh, speak more generally on the panel. Um, I'd like to start with Cindy Chupak, who has a wonderful career, which, um, you know, I, I guess I should read this, or would you like to talk about what you've done? <laughs> um, but, Cindy, you told me that you feel like you have been able to manage your career. And one of the questions is, you know, does managing your career only happen when you have the opportunity to say no to something? Is otherwise, is managing your career, you know, desperately looking for any job that you get? Or is there a way to manage your career when you're less in demand? And uh, Cindy is an incredible writer who's, who's gone many sitcoms, was the executive producer of Sex and the City for many years. And you told me that after you had a lot of success, there came a time when you had a choice. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Um, you mean from everybody loves Raymond? Or? Yeah, I mean, if you would just give the audience a little um, summary of, of, you know, your career and then... Well, I think this is... We'll probably touch on some of these, so I'm going to give you the very quick... But, um, I mean, I grew up in Tulsa, so I had no, no contacts or whatever. And I always loved writing, but it took me a while to find the right kind of writing. And I feel like for writers, that's a big part of the challenge is to, you can be barking up the wrong tree and trying to get into sketch writing or drama writing or even a novel, and you should be doing So it took me a while. I thought journalism, and then I wasn't so great at hard news. And it took me a while to, and I, then I looked into advertising. And I finally wrote a magazine piece when I lived in New York that a producer spotted, and she told me to think about sitcom writing. And for me, it was this flair. Um, I didn't do it with this purpose, really. It was my favorite magazine, this magazine, New York Woman, and the back page was always an essay. And I just loved the magazine, and I wrote this first-person piece. So it was really my sense of humor and my um, my perspective. And this woman was working on so it was the first time I thought about TV writing I'd have to say and so I moved to LA and I took a class and I hooked up with a partner and we were on really shitty shows for a long long time <laughs> which we were hard to get on to <laughs> and even at those shitty shows we tried to do our best and there were there are writers on those shitty shows that go on to make great shows like one writer at our very first show which was Baby Talk, starring Scott Baio, and it was sort of based on Look Who's Talking. It was <laughs> when they even <laughs> it was fantastic. I'm sure you remember. It. Um, <laughs> and in fact, at one point, they decided we needed a consultant who was funnier to write the baby lines, <laughs> which was really insulting <laughs> to all of us. Like we're like we can't handle the baby. 
But anyway, <laughs> on that show, uh, <laughs> I remember Anne, Anne Flett, who went on to, Anne Flett Giordano, and she ran, or was on Frasier for a long time. She was on that show with us, and she and her partner knew us and our writing, and we tried to do good scripts, you know, wherever we were. So uh, you realize this is a very small community, and even on this, like a first show that you might get that might be for kids television or animated, you might meet people that you need. And another thing, I feel like I'm, I'm going on too long. No, there's just a, one point that I want, to, <laughs> want you to get to. But so, you know, okay, managing your career, tip number one, no matter what show you're on, you can do a really outstanding professional job. You know, it's attitude. You know, managing your career partly is managing yourself and partly is managing your team, which we're going to talk about. Right. And part of managing yourself is to have respect for your craft, regardless of your attitude toward right, the, work, the show you're on. But I, before we go on to the next person, I would like you to talk about what happened after Everybody Loves Raymond when you were offered a lot of money and... Right. stupidly turned it down. Yes. Um, so I finally like worked my way up to uh, decent to coach, and then Phil Rosenthal, who created Our Very Loves Raymond, was on coach at the time and hired me and my writing partner who I worked with. And uh, we were at a point in our career where we were going to split up as writing partners, and I and CBS was offering me a lot to stay on Everybody Loves Raymond. It was a big hit show, and I was finally on a hit show that my parents had heard of, and it was huge <laughs> to be on. And that was a really happy show, very well run. But it wasn't really what I, I wasn't married yet, I didn't have kids, it wasn't exactly my life. And, um, and at the time, I was going to write a new spec to try to show what I could do alone without a partner. And Sex and the City had just started. And it was this teeny cable show no one had heard of, really. And, um, and I, I was going to just write a spec, but then I had a friend on there and she said, you should try to come in and pitch. And I, and I did, and, and I, it was just such a love fest from the beginning. It was like every idea I talked about with my friends, everything I wanted to write about, everything I had in a journal as a kernel of an idea, was like perfect for them. And so I wrote this freelance script, and based on that, they wanted to hire me. And I remember my dad, who was an accountant, was like, why would you leave? Everybody loves Raymond. Like, he didn't, hadn't heard of Sex and Save. It was on HBO, which seemed like really well, What about the million dollars? And then the million dollars. So CBS was <laughs> trying to offer me. I'm sorry, I'm such a long one. <laughs> CBS was offering a lot of money. It was like a million dollars for this development deal to stay on to stay on Raymond. And I remember I thought, no, I want to go write what I have so much more to say about. And I thought turning this down is going to feel great. And it didn't. It felt like, what the hell? Who the fuck do you think you are that you're ever going to get offered this kind of money? Like, as soon as I said no, I felt sick. And I was like, what am I doing? Oh my god, I'm an idiot. And my dad, the accountant, was like, what are you doing? But anyway, it really changed. It changed the course of my career to go write this thing that was really in my heart and that I had so much more to say about. And so that was Thank it. you. That's so, the end of my sorry long <laughs> Um I'd like to go to the, the other writer on the panel, Margaret Nagel, who Margaret has had a different relationship to managing your career. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when we were talking, it seemed as though you felt that instinct and serendipity played a bigger role in managing yeah. your career, which has been extraordinary. Margaret is an actress who um, began writing, you know, relatively, uh, you know, later in your... Late. Late. Um, and right out of the box, uh, wrote the Emmy winning HBO drama Warm Springs um, about FDR. And uh, why don't you talk about what happened after that in terms of managing your new, sudden, well, stellar career? Well, it, it wasn't so new. It, it, it was weird because I was writing in features because I Warm Springs was my spec script, so that's what I was going out on, and nobody in features cared that I'd written a TV movie at all. And oh, you and, wrote that... And on so, your own, you weren't hired to write that. No, uh, uh. That's what I wrote, sitting in waiting rooms and in my car <laughs> and everywhere else, because I felt like I was paralyzed from the waist down too. So I didn't, because I was in the wrong career. So that was my spec, and so I was going out on movies and off that spec, taking meetings, and absolutely no one cared, and they still kind of don't care uh, that I wrote a movie for TV that was in any way significant or did well, and they still go, what's that? Oh, I, I don't want to read that. Um, I'm like, well, you can watch it. I don't want to watch that. You know, and so I'm constantly, it's a, it's, it's a weird thing, because when you write a, t a TV movie, it's like this weird genre that's sort of on the way down right now, even though you can do these great things with it. So you're not 
a TV writer, right? But you're not a feature writer. So it's this, it, it, it didn't get me. But work. in terms of managing your career, at that point, you saw yourself as a feature writer. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. So how the hell did you end up running a TV show? So I ended up, what happened was, I hadn't, HBO hadn't signed off on Warm Springs yet, and, but I used it to, there was this script, it, there was a project at Paramount that had been announced and they didn't have a writer for it. And I just knew, it was about Sudan and the Lost Boys of Sudan, and I just knew I could write this movie. I just knew it. I have friends from Africa, and I just, I just knew I could tell the story. So I went in, and, and it took about a couple months to get a meeting, and I kept calling UTA going, I really want a meeting on that. And they're like, well, you know, Jeff Nathanson's going to write it, or, you know, they're going to pay a million dollars to this person. And I was like, well, when they all turn it down, please don't forget me. And finally, just to shut me up, they got a meeting with the assistant to the development executive, who was like, you know, I read that polio thing you wrote, it's not bad. <laughs> and, and I was like, here's the story of the Lost Boys. I pitched him the entire movie. And he said, let me get the development executive. And I pitched him the entire movie. And then he went and got the producer, and I pitched him the entire movie. And then I had to go pitch the director of the movie. And then I pitched four sets of executives at Paramount the movie, because they were like, she's written this movie. All I had was this polio. And then... I went, and then I went and I had to pitch it to Sherry Lansing, who openly wept and then said, you have to leave the room right now. And I went outside and I went, oh my God, they're calling Jeff Nathanson. I can see it now. Story credit by Margaret Nagel. <laughs> oh my God, I've just pitched myself out of this job. But they gave me the job. You know, I got like scale plus 10. I wrote this movie for them. And then proceeded to do what you do in movies, which is you rewrite until you're dead. And so <laughs> I was two years down the line rewriting this movie. It never ended. And, um, and the title was changed to The Lost Writers of the Sudan. Right. And I was actually collecting unemployment and writing the movie because that's wow. it was costing me. And so um, I called UTA. I called Sue Nagel at UTA because we had the same last name. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew she was TV. I literally called her. I go, you know, could can we meet? And so we met, and I didn't even tell the feature people at UTA I was doing this. I felt like, oh, they're going to kill me, because they had this idea of this feature career for me, and I just said, I'm so broke working on this job that you guys got me, um, and I want to <laughs> talk about TV. And that's how I ended up writing a pilot. Mm. And, then at the t and then she goes, well, you know, I don't know how we're going to get you a TV deal. And then Warm Springs got made a year later, and then I said, no, I don't want to write for TV, and I went to write a movie for Plan B. I got a job for... Brad Pitt, and then that movie got torn up in the divorce. That got, it was a custody battle over that movie. And then um, Warm Springs came out, and it was nominated for Emmys. And Sue Nagel called me back. She goes, now I think we can get you a deal. <laughs> so that's how, I got, that's how I got a year later. And then you described to me that when you went in to pitch for the blind pilot deal, you had gotten an email from a friend <laughs> right before the meeting and said yeah. this email could be a TV show. Yeah, I got an email. Uh, from my friend Eileen's husband, and Eileen had had cancer in college, and her cancer had come back like so you went on from ago. polio to cancer. Then we polio, you know, disease. Uh, here we go. You know, <laughs> genocide, polio, cancer. It's you know, I'm very commercial, and so um, uh, so then I got this email from him, and he sent it to everybody who'd ever known her, and he put us all in the header of the email. So the weird thing, you open the email, and you basically saw the email in the name of everybody you'd known for the last twenty years, and New York and Chicago and L.A., and it was like, and he said, you know, we've always been convinced that the doctors were wrong, but I think this time we have to come to terms with the fact that we may be right. And it was like, oh, God. And I went into Warner Brothers, and they were like, what are your ideas? And I'm like, um, what if I, and I printed out, I said, what if I wrote, see all these people? He was married to her, but they're not married. She's gay now. She's actually going out with her down here, but that's like, we'll talk about that later. And then, and I just started going through the people in the header, and I said, what if we just back this up five years? Because all our lives were, to, were, you know, these two people, they weren't going to get married, and they, but they had to stay together because they were friends with Eileen. And it's just this, this forced closeness and the idea of living with cancer and not dying of cancer and, and, and where she was. So I just went in and they went, okay, sure. I was like, oh, thank you. What if I just sold? Oh, my God, I don't even know how to write this. I don't know. The downside I just was, of the yes. Yes, the downside. You know, oh, my God, how am I going to write this? What do I have to say? You know, so, so that it was, it was serendipity and it was instinct and... That's sort of... Now, that's an example of really trusting your own voice. I mean, you wrote Warm Springs. You developed a complete pitch for the Sudan movie. 
because I knew I could never, I never, I'm sometimes, you know what, hard work really pays off. That's my, that's the moral of my story is that it's all about the hard, hard work and, you know. You know, so you didn't, yeah, you didn't write spec scripts for TV shows. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do this and, you know, and following your own voice and working and really hard And one thing I want to say ways. is that when I met to get the blind script deal, uh, the head of TV at Warner's, he goes, I don't even know why we're doing this with you because um, you've got the polio and the genocide script. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I wouldn't be, you wouldn't even be needing me if I hadn't written those two scripts. And if I'd written a West Wing, it would be under a pile this high on the floor of your office. So I had to get out of that pile. I skipped the pile. I'm here now. If you want, I can write you a West Wing spec, but I think that's a huge waste of our time. And also, frankly, you know, don't you, you want a person's voice. The thing about TV writing that makes it so special and so unique and so exciting and, and so worthwhile is that you write in your voice and the best TV is in your voice. And so often when you write a movie, there's a, not that you don't have to compromise your voice in TV, but I, I had felt after doing two years of rewrites, it was like I got let out of a box, you know, and got to write exactly the way I saw it. And they were either going to make it or they weren't. And at the end of the day, they weren't going to have me rewrite it for two years. It with was TV. like with TV, you know, TV was either it's a yes or a no, and moving on. Where with so let's move on. So, right yeah, there. thank you. <laughs> we'll come back, but. Um, Elizabeth Stephen is the president of Mandalay Television. She's the executive producer of the show, wonderful show, Brotherhood, on uh, Showtime. And uh, you're currently developing 13 original series. That's a lot. That's yeah. like two networks right there. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to go quickly through the bios because you can read those. Just know that everybody here on this panel is a genius and a wonderful person. Um, <laughs> According to Jan. Uh, <laughs> you know, Elizabeth, we are talking about the word lazy because, you know, what Margaret just said, well, okay, managing your career is about managing yourself partly and working hard seems pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. But as a producer and executive and as the person who is the gatekeeper, who these folks will be coming to with their ideas and mm -hmm. wanting to get to the next stage in their career, what qualities do the writers have who you work with that at the end of the experience make you recommend them or mm -hmm. not recommend them? Um. <clears throat> we had a conversation yesterday, and the word lazy came up, and I'm going to live to regret using that word. <clears throat> so I want to just no, clarify. But it, um, no, but it, it's true. I mean, let's call, you know, I'd like this panel to be very honest. And, you know, we were talking. In, yes, in, absolutely. Like there's the word brutally honest. Yes. I, I don't think brutally <laughs> should go with honest. <laughs> well, honesty in this town is brutal, right? Right, exactly. exactly. Um, when we were talking, you know, Janet asked me, you know, what does it take for a writer that you're working with to be somebody that you want to work with again? And, you know, I work with two other executives, and we're kind of different non-writing executive producers because we really generate most of the ideas that we end up selling. And what we do is we work really hard to generate these ideas and flesh them out pretty well. And then we find the writer whose story is most similar to the story that we want to tell because, as Margaret said, as far as we're concerned, television writing is completely personal. And we're really looking for a writer who has a very strong, specific, authentic, unique voice so that the story that they are going to tell is a story that nobody else can tell. And in fact, every time we go into a pitch, I'll say to our writers, you have to go in there and you got to let them know that nobody else can write this story. That this so when is the show get, you were born to write. When do they get lazy? Well, <laughs> back to that word. You know, I sometimes hear from writers that they're very proud to say that they're very fast writers. And I think that's a very bad thing to like be saying proud you're fast of. In bed. <laughs> like bed. Like yeah. bed. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> um, but I think that's really true. And, you know, I think when we're younger, there's something to be said for being facile and being able to adapt quickly and being able to get your homework done really quickly. Um, and even, you know, having come out of, I spent 14 years in features, even in features, it's such a different 
what you're putting down on paper is so different because if you think about it, features, you just have to get them into the theater. Once they're in there, they're going to have their popcorn and their candy, and there aren't going to be any commercials, and you've got them. They're stuck there. And then once the movie's over, they don't have to come back, right? You hope they're going to tell their friends to come see it, but they don't have to come back. In television, it's really, really challenging because you have to write something that people are going to want to keep coming back to. You know, that's what it's all about. So when do we get too lazy? I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so we, we, are, we are very serious about the work that we do. And one of the things I think the most important thing about writing, frankly, is rewriting. And the times where I get frustrated are when a writer will say, um, you know, We'll go through notes with the network, and on a Monday and on Friday, we'll have a rewrite done. And if you're on staff and you've got a show that's already going, then that's great. That's fantastic that you're that fast. But if you are really being thoughtful about the characters that you're creating, especially in a pilot, and you're trying to create, you know, within 43 minutes or 60 minutes if it's premium table, a show that people are really going to get invested in, then I don't think, you know, depending obviously on the notes, but for, you know, serious notes from a network shouldn't take five days. I, you know, I've never, I've never really seen it happen like that. And, um, and I just feel like, you know, the writers who say, I've done 20 drafts, well, you know, if you dry, write every draft in five days, then I don't really think that that's a real draft. And, um, and most of the time it shows. And then we can get into the conversation of honesty in this business. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to ask all of the management and executive people here why they lie to us. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, uh, <laughs> um, I'm lucky enough, in full disclosure, to have two of my representatives here on the panel who have never once lied to me, um, <laughs> except when I begged them to. Uh, <laughs> but Nancy Etz <clears throat> is a uh, an agent at CAA. She was at ICM for many years before CAA. And uh, we all learned that she had a career in the fashion industry in Paris, which you can't tell from my outfit the, today, uh, uh, yeah. or any day these days. Which is the kind of advice I'm going to be asking you for from now on. <laughs> but uh, so, okay, you're, you know, I've heard agents say it's a marathon, not a sprint. What are you looking well, at? We both say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they have this list, like, taped up to their computer, like, ten sentences to say, and, you know, it's hard. It's like, oh, number three, yeah. Um, Truisms. But, you know, I just want to, I want to assure everybody here that it's not like everybody's career goes so smoothly, and, like, once, you know, you hear people's names that you think they have a great career, almost everybody is miserable at some <laughs> point and insecure and, you know, wondering if they're ever going to work again. And, you know, the, the people who are successful are the people who've been able to ride out the ups and downs. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. Okay. So how do you ride out the ups and downs? Well, luck plays a role in your early, you know, job finding and getting, you know, that I think representatives, um, it, it can be very frustrating for representatives, you know, it's sort of on the good side of luck, you know, there's that person who started as the staff writer on Friends and gets to stay on that show and have the benefits of coming off of a show like that. And then sometimes there's the fantastic writer who's coming off a show like Viva Loft from last year that only aired a couple of times and feels like, hey, I just got my first job, now I have to go get my other first job because they got sort of no credit for that. Um, so what can you do to control the, you know, the, the other aspects? Um, after you get your first job, I would say keep writing. You probably learned a lot from that first job. This goes home. back to the lazy uh, comment. Yeah. You know, that's really key. I mean, you know, lazy and complacent are not good things to be if you want to keep working. Go on. Yeah, you probably learned a few good tricks um, from working on a staff or writing your first pilot. And while your representatives are actively trying to find you the next paying job, 
um, you should keep on writing. And I think the best writers are those people that, you know, even if there wasn't a profession called writing, would still be doing it in the evenings because they're drawn to it while they have their day job. You know, those people that have to write, it feels good for them. It's something that they need to do. Um, and those people, I think, for us are the gems, you know, those are the real writers. And um, so, you know, we, we encourage you to keep writing for yourself throughout your career, you know, as Margaret, you know, showed that, you know, maybe it gives us something that we can actually sell. Maybe it's that great script that you write three years into your paid writing career that gets you the next five jobs. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing. And then also, you know, I think go into your... Um, into every job, sort of understanding what the job is of all the people around you. You know, what does your studio executive want from a staff writer? What does the executive producer want from you at your level? And you can ask questions. Ask them how to be good at your job and helpful to them. Um, you know, and, and I think always, you know, learn how to communicate properly and, you know, effectively with people. And my motto is always, you know, be direct but be kind. Um, and that way, so where you know, there's the no misunderstanding. Come in? <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't no, know. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. We'll get to lying. <laughs> yeah, we're going we'll to get, get to lying. We'll but, get to lying. You can um, ask Larry all I, about I, the lying. I do, <laughs> have a, I do have a follow-up question on that. You know, I know that when I was um, when I was starting out, you know, and had sort of serendipitously found myself being offered a job writing for TV. It wasn't something that I had tried to do. I was an independent filmmaker and I was writing feature scripts and um, but I was very confused about whether I should be trying in my first few jobs to be like the star of you know of the writing staff and write like hit it out of the park you know or whether the job was to work for the creator of the show in whatever way they needed you know I think that that's something that a lot of writers need to get some perspective on. What What is your perspective on that? Well, ideally, you would be both the star of the staff and the person who's doing what the showrunner wants. Um, but I think um, you should strive to do your best writing on the show. But I think if if that means taking a lot of your showrunner's day and sort of talking about how they can get the best out of you, it may not be effective for them. Um, no, I think this is a really important point because who, you know, when, when you have a job, okay, if you're lucky enough to get on a hit show, you know, you get a lot of credit with that, um, you know, for just being on that show. The, the, the magic dust gets sprinkled on you. But you can be a fantastic writer and work on a number of shows that aren't hit shows. And, you know, you that is a more difficult position to be in, you know, right? For, like, Larry, you can come in on this too. So if you're, you know, if, if you're looking ahead and you're not on a hit show and you're just beginning, is your audience, you know, is your audience the showrunner who... Um, may recommend you for your next job, or are you trying to wow the executives who, like, say, oh, wow, you know, that one script was really stood out? I mean, I, I, again, in a, in a perfect world, you want to try to, you know, hit both. I mean, it's... it's. Um, but which one would, let's say it's not a perfect world, just theoretically speaking. Right. Um, which, you know, which one... It's hard for an executive to know exactly what a writer did, because if you're a staff writer on a show, your executive producer helps you shape the story. There's a lot of tabling, and so it's not so often that a writer's pure first draft will go to executives, but they'll hear from the showrunner and they'll observe the writer. I'm not too, sorry, no, it's kind of, but so it's really for me. I always felt like, you know, the more you impress the people in the room with you and the writers around you, and especially the executive producer. That word will get out and then be well behaved and kind around the executives, but it's really the people in the room who know what you're contributing or not. So Larry, you, um, Larry, uh, runs a wonderful and very prestigious management company. And uh, in terms of people managing their team, I mean, okay, so. You're writing, you're not lazy, you keep writing in your own voice while you have a job, you don't become complacent, you 
work to contribute the most to the executive producer of the show, because that's what's really going to make your career work long term. Um, and so what if, you know, but what if it doesn't work? You know, what if the show goes down in flames? What if you don't hit it off with the executive producer? You know, what if you get fucked over by a maniac? <laughs> yeah. How do you recover? Well, hopefully your representation, your agents and your management team, um, if you have both, um, have been building a, cam a campaign. Our job is to build a campaign for clients from the get-go, which what that means is uh, to build as strong a base of possible for clients to go out and meet people in the community. And a lot of these meetings are you know, general meetings, and so clients will go, well, I'm not really sure, like, you know, what is the purpose or how do I get the most out of this? And we try to, you know, educate the clients that these meetings are going to be people that you're going to be in business with, hopefully, for a long time. I mean, some people leave the business and such, but a lot of people are going to be in this business in some capacity as a producer, as an executive, whatever it is. So it's really important for us as representatives to go out and build a campaign. And that's ongoing while the client's working, you know, whether we're launching them, wherever they're at. And so... Um, you know, it's just, it's, that's really, you know, the most important thing is, is like I said, to, to build that. And I think, um, um, you know, if the show goes down in flames, I mean, hopefully that you've got, um, you know, a base of fans that basically, you know, want to be in business with you. And that's our job is to basically, you know, help build that base so we can identify and, you know, you know, potential jobs that we can, you know, alert to the client and basically match up with their material and, you know, you know, it's all about sort of like threading the needle because sometimes we have to make sure that we get a client who's got a certain type of voice or a certain type of material in front of, you know, they're looking for a certain need. And so it's always about learning how to sell that particular client, you know, in terms of just in a broad sense, but in specifics. And what does a manager do that's different from an agent? I mean, should the writers in this room have both an agent and a manager? Or what type of writer should and what type shouldn't? Um, well, I... If I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me that, I would be I could really retired. I'll give you a dollar. Uh, thank you. Um, I, my, my point of view is I don't think everybody needs, I mean, I should be saying everybody does, but I, I don't think everybody needs an agent and a manager. I think it's a very personal thing. I think that, um, um, you know, it's everything from, honestly, it's everything from, uh, as a writer, I don't get it, which is totally fine, as in I'm not sure why I have to pay two commissions which is perfectly legitimate because you have to manage your money and manage your overhead, and you have to understand it. You have to feel there's value there. Um, a lot of it is just, I think, not so much an agent or a manager, but the right people in your, in your life. And that could be what I'm saying is, is I think that, you know, I, I think that if I, if, if I wasn't managing when my clients have a manager, I, I don't know. They would be a long time. Maybe they would go to a different, you know, they find a, 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 a good fit with another management firm. Maybe they wouldn't. But I think a lot of it is, you know, we um, um, usually work with a um, you know smaller number of clients than the, the, the bigger agencies. The truth of the matter is, is an agent and a manager are doing a lot of the same things. It's just that this town is very, 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 very competitive. And everybody says it's a small town, but it's a big town. And what I mean by that is, it's like I, I feel, and I don't need this perspective. Um, you know, I can get anybody. You know, for the most part, you know, sort of like I should be able to get you know find my clients read, my clients submitted, and all that. But a client really should want more than that. They should want the quality of the relationships we have. It's hard for a representative to have quality relationships with everybody across the board. So, you know, I think it's really just a personal thing. I think that, you know, it's worked out well for our business. Um, we've had clients for um, uh, many, I've been this is 17 years now, I've had clients for, some of my clients have been with me, you know, 16, 17 years, and many have been with me for, you know, one or two years. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it, it's just it's just a personal fit versus a blanket statement across the board. You know, you need to have an agent and manager. It's just kind of like feel your way through it. Well said. So, Nancy, do you find that your the clients who have managers um, does that make your life easier, or is that sometimes like stepping on your toes and making it more difficult? I think it depends on the manager. Um, <laughs> Larry and I have a lot of clients together, yes. and it's very collaborative. So it's, it's a it actually makes my job easier because we sort of have this shorthand, and we can just sort of 
you know, boom, 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 split up, you know, the business of the week for our client and how we're going to attack things. And sometimes we're attacking the same thing from different sure. angles. You know, and there are, you know, the great managers are great help. And then there are a lot of managers out there that are not a great help. And, you know, you feel kind of bad because it feels like, you know, the client isn't getting their money's worth. But, you know, it's <laughs> the great representatives are great representatives and a great help. Well, Elizabeth, in your point of view as a buyer, what? I'm actually a seller. And, but, <laughs> right. But right now I want to talk to you about. Okay. You know, it's, you choose, I mean, you talked, and Robin Bud also mm-hmm. talked about generating a lot of the ideas mm-hmm. and then seeking out writers. Yeah. So you are, in a sense, hiring mm-hmm. writers, choosing writers mm-hmm. to, you know, have the benefit of your incredible company mm-hmm. behind them. So, you know, I assume that um, agents and managers are pitching writers to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so what? criteria, you know, is, is it personal? Is it like a particular agent, you you will believe what they say, another agent, you just look at them as a salesman? What criteria, how does somebody, you know, get a reputation and how does their management impress you so that you act on it? Mm-hmm. Well, I think across the board, whether you're an artist or you're a manager or an agent or a producer or a studio executive, you know, in this town, it's all about your work and it's about your point of view. And um, so if, if I get a call repeatedly, if I get repeated calls from an agent who sends me material that he or she says is phenomenal and I don't think it's that great, then I'm not going to be that excited about the next person that they are pitching to me. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it ha- it, it's about their reputation. It's about the relationship that I w- may have with them. It's about who their other clients are. Um, and if it's somebody new on the scene, then it's really about, you know, the material. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting because if you don't have an agent, um, it's kind of a catch-22 because how do you get somebody to see your material? And one thing I will say is you had a meeting with one of the assistants. The assistants are the gatekeepers to this business. And I started out as an assistant. You probably started out as an assistant. I don't know if you did. Mailroom. Mailroom. Okay, same thing. (laughs) Um, And, uh, you know, and the fact of the matter is it's the assistants. um, It's the assistants that are really kind of on the ground floor. And they're the ones who, if they're good and uh, are curious and interested, they're going to be the ones that are actually going to be more open to reading new material. And, um, and, and again, it's, it's an apprenticeship-based business, so most people move from that job and they move up. So I had, one of my first jobs was reading a big pile of spec scripts for Disney TV animation, but it was really good for me as a writer to realize that people weren't hoping to hate your stuff. I was actually hoping to find something fantastic, because when it was fantastic, it was so easy to pass along. Made and, you look good. Yeah, and it was just fun to see what a life of its own a good script would take on. A great script, because a good script where there was like, well, this was kind of good, but there were these problems. If you have to pass it on with caveats, it's really hard to make things happen. But if it was great, you could just you could just see it take on life of its own. So it's good to know at the end of every pile, there's some low 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 level person like me who was excited to see something great. So for for any of you, you as if you're a writer and you're wondering if your agent is doing a good job for you. What would be some of the signs? You know, how can writers evaluate the job that their representatives are doing? I, I, oh, it's so hard because I was an actress, so I've had so <laughs> many agents in my life. Um, you have to generate something that is so definitively what you do, like you know that that cannot be turned down unilaterally. It has to be, this is where the lazy element, that that script that is not the good script in the pile, but it's the only script in the pile. And I knew that with, like, for example, my script, that I had one shot at most of these agencies. And so I had to take that shot. And when you're working with an agent, you have a responsibility not just for them to go open doors, but you have to have something for them to open that door with that they never have to apologize for. And that you know that, if someone doesn't like it, then it's simply 
and, and I don't mean to, you have to love this thing that you've put in their hands so much or this, this thing you've generated that if someone says no, it's because it's not their taste. You know, I wrote a movie that was period and it was dramatic and that's not a lot of people's taste, but it's going to be Scott Rudin's taste or it's going to be, do you know what I mean? And so then you have to, I, I think if you let an agent, if you just put it all in the hands of an agent, it's just an unbelievable mistake. And not that you can do their job for them, but it's you've got to give the material to work with. And if the material isn't getting you meetings and they're good agents, then you need to generate more material. You need to just keep turning over the rock. That's It's the good and bad news about being a writer. I think that your work, you've got the tools to make your career happen. So in managing your career, I mean, this sort of goes to everything they've been saying, but like, I did these little essays about dating just because I liked writing those, and I did maybe one a year, and I kind of always had an eye toward I wanted to do a book of these essays about dating. But also, when Sex and the City came along, and I had written Coach and Baby Talk and Everybody Loves Dreaming, I had this stack of, like, these essays that I'd just done out of love. And I kind of feel the same about if you have a one-person show. Or so I feel like, A, you keep doing the stuff you love. Like, that was a total passion project for you. So it found probably the right agent and the right execs. And if you're just writing something because you think it's commercial or you think this is what will sell, you're not really doing yourself any service because you got to really try to, in your sample, especially when you're trying to get management and agents in your first job, you want it to be reflective of who you are and what you're going to have a lot more to say about and why only you. You're the only person who could have written this. And then in addition, what you were saying about the first job, I mean, when I got my first job with my writing partner after that first job, which wasn't a great credit, we had to write a new spec right away that would get us our second job, and the bar was much higher for a second job. First job, they kind of take a chance on you, and you're cheap. That second job. So uh, we just kept getting material. And then the other thing, sorry to be long-winded again, but I feel like your job, before you blame your agent and manager, whoever is, you have to really let them know everything you've got in your arsenal. So not just the scripts you have, but I love, you know, sketch comedy. I've got these sketches. I've got these essays I wrote that maybe, I don't know, something, or I have a dream of writing a play. And tell them, like, everything, and even in your pat, you know, ideally you want to find an agent or a manager, somebody who's going to have time to listen to you long enough to at least understand your story <laughs> and everything you've got to offer, because then they might be talking to an exec who says, I have this passion project about golf, and you know that your client was a caddy for 20 years or whatever. So everything you are and everything that's brought you at this point is what's going to help you. And um, and in, in the agent, I was just thinking about this because you called Sue Nagel. Like within mm -hmm. your agency, sometimes you get in with if like you have a, the same last name. <laughs> it helps a lot. <laughs> agent. I, but I found that's as uh, like used to be Schwab's drugstore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found as I moved up, like I'm at Endeavor, and I'm with Ari Emanuel, who's the head, and he's basically the uh, model for Jeremy Piven on, if you've seen. So that's Ari. So he has two seconds on the phone, so he doesn't have time to listen to me even give this answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I always would find like a kind of a lower level agent who I could call and just say I'm bored, or here's what I'm worried, or here's what I want to do. So you have to be able to talk to your manager or agent and, you know, not use them as your therapist, but be able to tell them what you're interested in, what you want, what shows you love. You know, there has to be that kind of dialogue, and then you'll help them represent you better. So, Nancy and, and Larry, do you want to hear everything about your <laughs> clients? Am um, I annoying? Yes, actually, you do. Yeah. No, because seriously, um, you know, what is the best way for your client to help you do the best job, and what do you consider the creative, like what excites you, what motivates you to take the extra step for a client? Um, well, I try never to sign people unless I'm, you know, enthusiastic enough that I'm going to take every right. step necessary. But um, original material, absolutely. Like, the, you know, for the, what both of you had was that, you know, that drive to write something that you care deeply about, I think, is um, what we're always looking for. You know, it is hard to get super excited about, like, a great, you know, curve your enthusiasm spec because even the best ones sort of fall into a bell curve. But, you know, when you do write... Um, you do read, you know, a short story or a one-act play or a feature. You know, even though I'm in television, I respond very much to, to original voices. Um, you know, something that it, it is it is something that I can go out with and say, like, read this short story. This is something that nobody else has done. You know, this is their voice. And, um, 
and uh, and I do like to hear everything about the clients so that you know we do know all those secrets for I'll be getting calling you, the you later yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the, with the because I, I have a really really good um, yeah. story I wrote in third grade that um, <laughs> been waiting for um, but okay so do you sit down with your clients either your new clients or clients that you've had like every year or, you know, every six months or whatever and say, okay, what's the master plan now? I mean, how do you know? You, no. I, mean, no, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's never that formal. Yeah. We're not going to do lying. No, no lying. No lying. No, no, it's, no it's, lie I, it's not that formal. I mean, if a client wants to sit down, sure. But, you know, we're talking to the client all the time. I mean, when we get in business with somebody, you know, I usually say to them, um, you know, if we're a mom starting out with somebody, you're going to know in a month how I work. You're going to understand how I think. You're going to have a very good feel, and you're going to like get it, and you're just going to feel right where it's not. So it isn't so much like give it a shot, but there's sort of a pattern, like a momentum to how we work and how we communicate with the client, and they start to understand. And like any other relationship, we have to sort of feel each other out. Um, so, you know, I don't do anything on a formal basis like that. I basically, um, you know, every client – Things differently. I mean, some clients will say, you know, uh, I know I'm on the third year of a show, or the last, I'm sorry, the um, the last year of a contract, and they'll plan ahead, and they'll be like, you know, you know, it's the, you know, it's nine months. I'm going to the last year of this contract. I've got nine months. I should basically, you know, figure out, you know, what spec or what specs I should have to hit the mark because I want to be on a new show. I want to basically, you know, their goal was to move on for whatever reason. So, you know, we have conversations with people. Whether they initiate it or we initiate it, um, I think one thing that Nancy said, which we all love original material because, frankly, it works really well with executives. But you know, I'm not trying to like you know play this politically. But the truth of the matter is, is that everybody writes differently, and everybody's got a different strength. And I'm absolutely convinced that certain people really write specs better than writing original material. I'm positive. Now, I can't figure that out until I work with them on a bunch of stuff, but. Some people do write that great spec where it's like, oh, my God, that's the thing that's going to like really launch them. And we, we can see that. And there's somebody that I just signed recently who's a, who's a baby writer who I've, I've known for about three years, and she's a playwright. And we do a lot of work with playwrights and um, sort of launch them into TV. And her plays were very, very good, but I didn't sure, was sure there's anything that was sort of like, could like, sort of like make a transition for her. And she started writing specs, and they were good. And she finally found her voice in writing this rescue me. And when I read it, I was like, Wow. I mean, I was, like, really excited. And so I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's so hard to make generalizations. Um, what's happened in our businesses is there's more people crossing over from the feature business um, into creating shows and running shows. And there are executives coming over from the feature business into TV. So a lot of people are used to reading original material. So they're requesting that a lot to basically help judge um, how they want to basically hire somebody. But it, it, it's, uh, you know, there's so many really ways you can kind of like create an angle and create a way into this business. You just, it's just about really just being patient and, and trying a lot of things. And I also think, you know, one, I think the litmus test for the agent client or manager client relationship is do you have the same goals? Do you feel like, you know, you've communicated your goals for your career to your representatives and in, you know, a somewhat timely manner in the course of the relationship? Do you feel like, you're on the same page, and, and their goals are your goals. You know, sometimes you, you know. I think sometimes it's just the wrong fit between people, and you know, or they're not hearing what you know where you want to go, and informing you of how what the steps you need to take to get there, and doing their part to get you there. Well, well you, do you ever see, um, you know, I mean, I'll hear agents say, "Oh, such and such a writer, you know, they're not being well represented." If I were representing them, I would have them do X, Y, Z. What is it that the agents who, you know, you feel aren't managing their clients' careers well, what, what is it that they, they're doing wrong? Um, I think poor communication is a, is a big sort of, you know, follow-up point for a lot of agents with their clients, you know, not informing them about, you know, important developments in the atmosphere that they're working in, um, not giving them the big picture, not giving them the tools, you know, uh, you know, and, and the advice on how to get from point A to point B that they need. Uh, so information is false. Yeah. Well, can I say something about representation, though? Yeah. Um, 
You know, I think that people expect that once you get an agent or a manager that they're going to do everything. And you can't expect that. We all have to be our own advocates. And so even if you have Larry and Nancy, you know, as your team, you know, you still, you still, it's like health care. You know, you have to think about it in terms of your own advocacy. Because even if you have the best doctors, if you're not really kind of minding your own store, you know, there are plenty of other clients or patients that that physician has. And, you know, things fall through the cracks. And so, you know, just like, you know, Cindy's saying you should keep writing and you should always be writing, I think you also, you know, you need to think about what your master plan is. And you really, you know, I think you have to look at your representation at the team that you work with, at your executives, at your producers. I think you have to look at it as, you know, you have to be the captain of your ship. Because at the end of the day, everybody will fail you. Because nobody is as important in your life as you are. And uh, I, just, I just think it's a really, really important thing so that when you get with that manager or that agent and you think you have scored and every door is going to open, you know, you, ha- you still have a lot of work to do. At the end of the day, everyone will fail us? <laughs> In some way or another, oh, absolutely. That's kind of, you know, that's actually a great point, and it explains a lot about my life. But... Um, <laughs> 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 I had known that. Um, but, but that way it's not all your fault, right? It's none of it's my fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but writers have fantasies. I mean, we are theoretically people who have imagination. And I know from myself and my friends that you always fantasize that somebody else has the agent who is, you know, doing everything and getting them everything and, you know, or somebody else has this secret to managing their career, you know, and, and it's very grounding to realize that, you know, for the most part, that isn't true. And I think I was in the uh, showrunner training program um, just this past uh, couple of months ago, and this was said over and over again. And it would astonish me that I didn't know this. You know, I've been doing this for a while, that you have to be a leader. You know, John Wells, who, you know, is someone you would think, okay, any agent, you know, would die to work with John Wells, and they must, you know. It. And, you know, basically, he says that, you know, you have to be the leader of your team, that you're, you should not rely now this is not to minimize at all what you guys do but you know what he said is you should not rely on your agents or managers to create your career you know and then pout if you know if it's not going the way you want that just as if you want to create a show it's your job to be seen as the leader of the team you know right or wrong it's your job to be seen as the leader of your career. And uh, can I, 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 you were saying about a master plan. I have the master plan. It's my master plan. I manage my career. I work with agents. I love them. I'm the boss. It, it, it's, it's up to me. And I don't, I, I'm very like. You hear that? See, no, you and I, I, I love my agents so much, and they're great, but they also know that I'm not waiting for them to do anything. If I wait, I cannot wait for them to think up what I'm right for. I can't, wait, I, it, you know, like I'll say, well, send, what are some of the, like the, the feature list? I'll, every once in a while, I'll, I'll look at it and, you know, send this to me. And they're like, but we're covering you. I said, I know, but I need to see it. Because, you know, you, there's so much they don't know about me and will never know about me. Even though I may try to tell them every, you know, that I was a champion bird caller, you know, <laughs> that they, you know, and of course there was a bird calling movie and they were like, well, what do you mean? I said, no, I, it's really embarrassing. I am a bird caller. You, know, <laughs> you don't know this about me. I intentionally um, did not tell you. And I didn't tell you. But now that there's this movie at Fox 2000, I don't know. Maybe, you know, but I'm, you know, like, I think you have to be, the buck ends with you, man. It's like, and maybe it's because I had to come up myself and, and I had to, to, to get all this generated myself, I just, that's, that's how I approach it. And I've never seen it any other way. That's why you're successful. I would say, I would say, um, but I think that's really atypical because I think that most of the writers that I meet 
that I think are wonderful and smart and, you know, coming out of like, um, um, you know, either great writing programs, or whatever. I mean, most people don't have a clue. It's not their fault. I mean, we have to, we, we tell They're them. They're just lazy. No, not at all. But, but I mean, you have a, have, a, have a specific background where you were trying to, you know, build your way up as an actress and you'd been through the business and worked with a lot of agents and had a different perspective. I just find that, you know, most writers, it has to be a process where we need to educate them on how to empower them, how to help empower them, because it is their job. But I don't think they're necessarily, it's not, most of them, it's not within them initially. I think right. we, it has to come from a process together. Right. You're not born, you know, with all the skills. And one thing I'd like to do on this panel is demystify. I mean, you know, I I just found out this stuff about how you're not supposed to, like, just sit in the corner and wait for your agents to do everything. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, maybe not that bad, but, you know, it, it's, it's like there's a humility, you know, maybe um, – that's the other side of the coin about working hard and having a humility about your work, you know, not feeling like a sense of pride, like, well, you know, if I were really considered to be such a great writer, I wouldn't have to call my agent and suggest <laughs> that they put me up for the bird caller movie. You know, it's, um, I think that, you know, writing when you are successful, continuing to write, you know, not just assuming that everybody's going to be coming to you. Um, getting over that pride, I think, is a big part of professionalism. There's also, I think there's an interesting curve that I've noticed that probably you asked. You have to have a lot of options to manage your career. I think early on, your career as a writer is very much saying yes to almost everything, at least going on the meetings, at least you never know. Like, you really try to be open that you might get something out of a job that doesn't sound right up your alley, as much as you're trying to tell your agent and manager exactly what you want. If you want to be on the office in 30 Rock, but you're getting a meeting at something you don't really like that much, you still it still might be a good first job. And then as you get older and you've done more, I feel like now my job is really saying no, like knowing, not that I'm getting offered a zillion things, but just leaving the space to do the movie I really want to write or the TV show that I really want to create and not just taking something... So I think it's sort of balancing that as you move along the curve. And, and you talked really about keeping your finances in a state where you can do that. I mean, that's part of managing your career. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I just, I heard early on someone said that one of the guys who created 30-something in uh, uh, Zwick, I think, at Zwick, said keep your nuts small so that you can always say, fuck you, basically, <laughs> which you don't say aloud, of course, to anybody, but uh, to who you're interviewing. But, but it, I just kind of got a small place, and I've had it since 97, and I've, I've tried not to have too many expenses in my life so that I can just take time off to write a spec or take a year to write the movie that's, like, really a passion project or, or just not take a staff job so that I can develop a TV show or whatever. And these are all great luxuries, I know, when you're just breaking in, it sounds like, who, who cares what you can say no to. But it's important, I think, to leave yourself the space, or even right now, like, to get a day job that pays your bills, not to have such high bills that you can't afford to take, like, a kind of a, pay, a day job that will let you still have the energy at night and in the morning or whenever you write to write your own stuff. Um, or to take a low-paying writer's assistant job that will get you in the door so that you understand how it all works. You know, so it's all part I of I think that's such it. important advice, and, and as an actor, I was given that advice too, you know, why this film actor, he did I indies, and he was like, and he, and he goes, I don't have to go off and do that miniseries and take my shirt off because I don't pay for a car in New York City to park it. And I didn't buy the place here, and I, and I keep it all really, really small, and I remember going, that's a really good idea. If you can keep your expenses really low, even when you're doing really well, I keep my expenses as low as I possibly can because I have kids too, but also it's just I never want to have to take a job for money, like get me a job for money. I need to be able to write what I know I'm, I can write and I can – I always think about is, can I say something with this? Can I help this project? Do I have anything to offer this with the way I work and the way I think? And, and that's how I approach the work rather than, oh, my God, i got to get a paycheck. Oh, my God, oh, my God. And it's not like I have that much money. I don't. But it's just it's so much better to come from that place to build a – you'll just build a better career that way if you can. Well, and also it's, it's so, so important. It's such good advice because, you know, this is, is – as much as this is a big town, it's a small town. And, you know, your reputation is really important. And, you know, as you're working, your, your behavior, you know, the way that you behave and your attitude – 
your sense of gratitude, um, you know, that is what people talk about, and that's what people will remember. So and what's a good attitude and a not-so-good attitude? But I, but well, I just wanted to say yeah. it's important if you can choose what you're going to work on, you should try to work on the things that you really are passionate about because I always feel like, you know, you've got to work until it hurts. You know, if it's going to really be good, I mean, you know, our group, we work until it hurts, and we, we expect that out of all the people that we work with. And um, so if you're working on something that you're doing just for the money, um, it's it will really it will hurt a lot longer. <laughs> you know what I mean? It will hurt your whole career. Yeah. yeah so I, I can't. I mean, I hear. I I just to say, there's so many times I've heard from friends of mine who are directors who are launching their their careers, and they'll go on a project where the director's been fired, and so it's a chance for them to jump in there. It's never a good idea. Never, you know, it never ever works out because at the end of the day, and you can look at, you know, you can look at scripts this way too. Um, you're going to be the one that's responsible for it, even if you're walking in in a huge mess. And there, no you know, one needs the explanation. Well, it was a huge mess, and yeah, da -da -da, and then right. you go to director jail. Yep. Or <laughs> you go to writer jail too, that's but right. director jail is much. It's, it's worse. <laughs> you, you, serve hard, you serve hard time in director jail, <laughs> and and it can be totally not your fault. So you yeah. have to be so careful. Yeah. Because that it all comes back. Like I took the deal I took to write my pilot was the was the lowest offering deal. It was Warner's, and um, they were offering the least money, and these other places were offering a lot more money. But my agent said, "You know what? If you'll get leave the money on the table and work at Warner's." Because they're going to get you, and they're going to mentor you, and that you're going to learn a lot from this process. And just, just you know, you don't need the money because I, I've been renting until about ten minutes. I mean, I've never even bought anything until a couple days ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, but but um, we'll be collecting. Um, yeah, but, but, change but, but it was it out. was a really it was a great decision, and the show ended up getting on the air. So it was absolutely the right decision to leave the money on the table. So just just be careful. Don't try not to make decisions because of money. Because I think sometimes they really bite you in the but, ass. But yeah. also, what's important about that story is you were very selective about who you chose to work with. And you know, as much as you can, and I think you should look at your representatives to help educate you on who the networks are, or the you know the executives, or the producers, because. That's a really important part of the process. And if you're working with people who aren't generous, who don't really care, who aren't going to advocate for you, then you're going to get, you know, and it, it happens. I mean, we work with a lot of writers who haven't been produced before, and, um, and we really stand by them. And there are plenty of times where we may be put in a situation where the network will say, should this person really be getting this credit? And we will say yes. You know, because that's who we are, and usually for working people who are working as hard as we are. Um, but you should really try to do your homework on who who's out there, especially if it's between two projects or two opportunities. Find out, you know, what's happened to the other writers that 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 producer or that agent or that executive has worked with. No, that's a great piece of advice. You know, on the one hand, you have to be really, really careful of your reputation. On the other hand, I I, I did a, produced a pilot recently. It was the first pilot that I had produced, and so I was for the first time involved in hiring people, and I found to my astonishment that, like, we were hiring directors. There, there was one director who nobody had anything bad to say about. <laughs> I mean, it's like you scratch the surface and somebody has something bad to say about everybody. And, you know, so that sort of put things in perspective, that, you know, it's it's... I feel like it's a balancing act. You know, you really, really need to be careful about your relationship, but you can't control everything. Mm -hmm. well, that's where you're and you're not agency. dead yeah. if you make a mistake. You know, right. you just have to get back on the horse. Well, the great thing about writers is you can just write something else, you know, that nobody else can write. It's your voice. I mean, that's, that's why you don't have to go to, there's no writer's jail. You know, you just put yourself oh, yeah. in there. You get in writer's jail. You get on a black. It when features, you know, at a studio, they well, features is a whole other. Story. They well, have lists at the studios. I'm going to open it up to questions, but before I do, I I do want to bring up the subject of lying, um, <laughs> because you know there is a sense, and Elizabeth and I were talking about this before, and I I I asked her why she thinks there's a culture of lying in Hollywood, and you said, well, it's it's because we don't want to hurt people. 
And I said that I thought that was lazy. Um, it's true. You know, it's really true. And from the perspective of a writer, you know, I I have found it very debilitating to be told, oh, we love it, we love it, we love it, and then it turns out that that's not true. That's right. It's like, well, why didn't you tell me what you didn't like so I could fix it? Mm -hmm. You know, what is your perspective? I mean, is there, is, are, you, are the representatives, you know, are you, is, is there like almost an expectation that you ma massage the truth in certain situations? I mean, do you feel like there are certain clients who you need to lie to and others who you know you can be honest with? How does that all work from your point of view? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I've never really have sat there and felt like I have to, um, um, you know, sort of evaluate clients differently. I mean, we try to be as straightforward as possible. I mean, the, the catch is, is that, you know, what we have to be able to do is to interpret as just a producer with the same thing, we have to interpret the uh, the politics and sometimes the bullshit that goes on with the stu with the networks, um, you know, or a studio on a feature end in terms of what's going on in terms of our conversations with them. You know, there's different things that are taking place that we have to be able to interpret and have to be able to come back and be as straightforward to the client as possible. That there's things that have to be interpreted. A client might have a conversation with um, a, uh, a a network executive and come back and we're saying, well, but that means this. You heard this, but it means this. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is just our experience with them. And so I think that's where when things are very, um, things are really uh, a lot at stake and things are heightened and there's a lot on the line, um, everything's very sort of precious. That's when, it, you know, it's really important to be as clear as possible. Well, one thing I know it's important to know yourself as, as a writer and as a person, and how many people here would want to be soft-pedaled if your representative got a bad critique of your work or or your personhood in a meeting. I mean, how many people would want to hear the truth? And how many would want it to be soft-pedaled for your morale? It's difficult to say it. You don't have to say it. Stop. <laughs> but I noticed that everybody did not raise their hand when I said how many people want to hear, you know, the plain truth. And I think that's something that maybe... But I think that's really interesting that you said, you know, first of all, I haven't heard anybody say you suck to any artist in this business, so I guess lucky for me. Um, but, you know, it's not about you. It's about the work, you know. And I think if you can find a way, and listen, I am not a writer. I've never professed to be a writer. I think I'm a really good editor, and I think I'm a good producer. Um, but I have an incredible amount of respect for what you do, and we spend the majority of our time with writers. Um, and so I know that when you're really doing that personal work and you're writing so hard that it hurts, which is what I want you to do, um, that when it's done, if there are things that aren't working about it, you know, it's hard to let go. I, I, I can only imagine how hard it is, you know, for, for you to then hear, well, this isn't working here, or I didn't understand this, or I didn't get this part of it. But you're doing yourself a disservice if you can't separate yourself from the work. You know, and it's really, really hard. And, and I know I'm being very strident and direct, but if you can try to do that, you'll put yourself in a much better situation because you'll be much more opening, you'll be more open to hearing, you know, what your representatives have to tell you, what the producers have to tell you, what your friends have to tell you, you know, and, and that's good for you. It's really, really good for you. So you have to remember it's about the work. It's, I think it's fair, though, and good advice to tell your agent you know, I'm, or even when you meet with people, like, I'm really open, I'm new at this, like, I'm happy to hear anything you think I could do better next time, or, because so, I think so many people are as honest with you as they feel you can handle, so and I will be that way with people who give me something of theirs to read. You can tell if they really want to hear what you thought, and really are open to hearing what didn't work, and will just listen rather than defend it, or if they kind of put up a wall pretty quickly, and you probably get the same thing when you're giving notes, and then... You're kind of hurting yourself if you put up that wall because then you're not going to We back hear. off. We'll back right. off because we, we don't want to hurt you. Yeah, it's like how much can you handle? You know? Or also you're kind of giving a signal how much you can fix because if an executive is telling you what Jan was saying even, like if she's feeling, well, I could have fixed it. I don't know. Maybe they felt like this is your passion project. You loved it as it was. They evaluated mm -hmm. it. They did love it. But in the end, it wasn't something they needed on their network, and they don't want to ruin their relationship with you. 
or if you really seem like I care so much and I like what you guys are doing and I think this could go a different way, like sometimes you can kind of give the signal you're you're open and you don't want to seem like a doormat. But I think there's a way to, right. in all aspects, just at least seem open and then cry at home, you know. <laughs> Which you, and I'm then not the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think crying's crying on the phone to me. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I think I can't speak for all agents though, you know. So I don't know. I can't say what their motivations are if you feel that your agent is lying to you but I think um, I never lie to my clients again we go sort of back to that direct but kind thing and sometimes we have to have really difficult conversations you know it can be anything to your new sample that you work so hard on is you know not getting the response we want in the marketplace to somebody on the staff thinks you're difficult to getting fired I mean it sort of runs the gamut and there are a lot of really difficult conversations and your agents and managers if you know they care about you they hate to give the bad news um, but it's important. I mean, the main reason that I'm honest is that's the right thing to do, but it's because it's, you know, we're not like doctors who anesthetize you and they'll wake you up and say, you know, here's your job, here's your career. We're partners in this and you need to have the information and we try and deliver it in the most kind way and constructive way possible. Um, you know, and if somebody were to say, you said what you're right, doesn't, people don't really say that. Um, but if somebody was, you know, a little cool about your work, we probably wouldn't share every detail, but we would give you, you know, the upshot so that you had that information and you're not just wondering, you know, my agent sent out my script and is not getting me meetings and now I'm really mad at them. I mean, it's partially out of protection for myself, which is, you know, we did send it out and here's the response, good or bad, and so that you can learn and, and get to that next level in your career? Well, you know, I, I found at the beginning when I started working in TV, I was very a little more precious about my writing. I think this is kind of a natural thing. You're kind of scared to listen to a lot of notes because you're afraid it was so hard to do what you did already. <laughs> you know, you, you're afraid that if you start pulling the threads, you won't be able to do it. And as you work more, you begin to, you know, get more confident. Um, and I think that's the sort of place that, you know, if, you, if you're coming from the place that there's nothing that you can't, that will destroy your chances, you know, that it's all just part of a process, that's probably a good attitude. Now, I'd like to open it up for questions. Hi. Um, <laughs> so I think it's pretty common knowledge that in order to get through someone like Elizabeth, we first need someone like Nancy or, or Larry, correct? And That's before there. any of them, you have to come to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Okay, well, um, in that respect, what would be to best, what would, without representation then, how would be the best way to kind of query ourselves to you? And I also throw this question to, to Nancy and, and Larry. Um, you know, people in your position, you know, without saying knowing your spouse or anything, you know, what how, how do you best, you know, look for baby writers? Do you, do you accept queries? Is it through email? You know, what would be the best way? Um, well, for me, most most of the clients that I take on are through referral. You know, either an attorney or a manager or an executive sometimes will say, like, I just read this fantastic script. Um, and that's, that's the largest uh, sort of category of people that I sign. Um, or there are people that I've known over the years who are ready to make a change. But also, you know, sometimes it's, you know, I read an article in the calendar about, you know, this, this thing on the web and just had a curiosity. And I'm not a great surfer of the web. But, um, you know, I just had curiosity. It looked kind of funny and I was intrigued and called the guys and started working with them like that, you know, and we'll all go to a play. You know, I love, I love signing people from the theater, you know, so, um, you know, random places. But normally people that are already kind of doing something creative. Um, I would, I would um, agree with all that. Well, the one thing I would add is um, my client base. I don't rely on them at all, but I think that the other group of people that refer people to me um, would be clients, um, people that they've observed, they've um, worked directly with or indirectly with. But it's again, it's sort of like just an extension. What Nancy said, just a, a series of you know referrals. Um, um, I have a big secret, and I'm going to share with everybody in this room. Find out where all the assistants in this business, whether they're at agencies or management companies or they work for studios or networks or production companies, find out where they hang out, start to get to know them, and give them your scripts. Great, great and that's the way you will get your career started without knowing anybody in this town. Where do they hang out? 
Well, two of ours are over there. <laughs> so, uh, where Aaron you, and Faye. Where do you guys hang out? <laughs> <laughs> but also, I think, I, I, I was just thinking all the meetings I got with agents, I got through writers who gave the script in, who read it and gave it yeah. to. Yeah. It, I, it was writers that helped me. Next question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. This has been great. Uh, my question is, once you're actually on a show for the writers, um, what, then your relationship with your agent, how does that change? And, and how do you, what do you need to do in terms of talking with your agent? Because you're focused on the show, right? Yeah, you don't talk to them for a long time. <laughs> I forgot. I, I mean, I, I literally didn't talk to them for months and months. So are they still doing, because they don't really have to, you're I mean, employed. they're always working, no offense, but... Right, sure, but, so but okay. are, there, are you managing stuff that's happening on the show and then talking to them? So can you it, talk about that? Do you mean Margaret didn't need it, apparently. But <laughs> no, I didn't talk to them for ages, and I didn't have any writers from that agency on my show. And um, Do you mean if you're running the show or just even if you're on staff at a show? So. Yeah, I had a feature that I was writing while I was doing my show, so that was, I would talk to my feature agent a little bit, but other than, because then I was crazy but I didn't need any I mean I didn't need anything and I couldn't go on meetings and I you're 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 incredibly busy trying to do your job so but if you're like a staff writer that's a different story well I, I think that at least from from our perspective it's again it's a, there's a window of time you know hopefully the, the client will be on the show uh, all season but if it's you know 12 episodes with the pilot maybe it'll be like five months the show will be off the air so let's so say there's a you know a four or five month window I mean we have to look at you know where the client who they know, who knows them, and how to build upon that. They're not going to go out for like five meetings a day, but it's it's more about how we can basically take advantage of that time to continue to you know introduce their work to people and you know sort of like you know um, let people know that there's an opportunity at some point to be in business with them and to basically continue to sell them um, while they're working on the show. And so that's I think you know the most important thing that we can do. But you don't have to tell the agent to do that. I mean I think that. Yeah, but when you run a show, you definitely need your agent to help you find the other writers that, I mean, I use mine a lot to bounce off reactions I was getting from the network and the executives and what how should I handle stuff. And then when I was trying to hire writers, I'd ask my agent if they knew of these writers. And, you know, so you use them a lot in that way. And then I think you are, shows can come and go so fast. It's not like while you're on it. I mean, it's almost like you have a new boyfriend. You don't want to start thinking about your next boyfriend just yet. <laughs> so you want to just enjoy it while it lasts for a little while. But when you start to see things aren't going great, then you start thinking at least, uh, you know, just, just you just start thinking ahead. And I'm always thinking ahead, and I use my agent for that. Okay, uh, back there. Suppose that you sent out a script early, and you sent out a little bit too early, and you get it out, and nobody likes really, well, they think there's a lot of potential in it, but they don't think it's quite right, the timing, uh, producer. Um, and what do you do if the, the script gets revised, and all of a sudden it becomes pretty spectacular? To where it is. Change the title. <laughs> Do, 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 uh, yeah, change the names of the characters, the title. What do you do with that? Situation? I think it's good to realize that it became spectacular after you revised it. Like you might have turned it in before it was spectacular. So you really want to hang on to your scripts. Don't get into this thing like it's stopping season. I got to get my agents for this. You know, like they better be spectacular because <laughs> you don't always get a second chance to go back. Oh, I know you read this a while ago, but second it's act is better, better now. Yeah, <laughs> they're not going to read you it again. Get that. So there's a lot of buyers. You just send it to some other buyers. Yeah, we didn't see it uh, yet. Hi. Um, my question is going back to the manager and agent uh, relationship. Uh, say, for instance, I mean, it's still sort of ambiguous. So what's, say, for instance, you have an agent and you've had an agent for one year, two year, and they've never sent you on a meeting. What kind of relate? What are they? What are they? <laughs> what's the point? There is none. That you are with the wrong agent. You should be and having you get a manager who will get you a better you should, agent. You, or again, you should be having a dialogue yeah. with them, even if you're not going out on meetings. You should be having a dialogue with your representative. What's going on with my material? There should be some sort of listen. We sent out the following ten places this month, this week, whatever. This is the status. Something going on, so you have a feel for how things are moving forward or they're not moving forward. But at least there's an ongoing dialogue. 
I mean, before you get to the meeting part. So, you know, but at least there should be something that is square one and then, you know, from there. But I, I think that what, however you want to evaluate or manage your expectations, if the expectation is I should have a certain number of meetings, that's fine. But at least you should at very least have a relationship where you're having a dialogue with that representative agent or manager. Yeah. I want to ask. Ooh, I want to ask about the lists that you get when you have an agent, and they once a week they'll send you the list of all of the the networks and the studios and what they're looking for. If you don't have an agent, you don't have access to the bird calling film. Um, you know, you don't want to stalk companies and be pitching something they're not interested in. And sometimes they'll have a meeting and they'll change what they're looking for. So how do you get that information? I'm almost wanting to ask your assistants. Um, you know, how do they feel about us calling and saying, what are you guys looking for? Before I start bugging Elizabeth for a meeting, can you guys tell me what you're looking for? Is that no. breaking a no. boundary? You need to be writing what you are interested in rather than looking for what somebody else is looking for. Okay, but if you have a voice, I mean, I have a voice, but have I have my 16-year-old woman voice and I have my mature woman voice and, you know, it, it's... You can. Are you writing scripts? Yes. Well, keep writing, and one script may be, you know, may have a, I don't know how ever old that woman is, but she may have that age child, right? And or, or you may have a, a couple of different scripts, but just write and don't, don't be so concerned with what everybody's looking for because they never really know what they're looking for. They don't know until they find it. So and just send it to you, and then let you decide. Yeah, but don't send it to me unless you feel really fantastic about it and you've let other friends of you, yours who are also <coughs> writers let you know what they think of it and you've actually listened to their notes and probably done some work. But you also know what someone's looking for if you look at the shows they're doing or the movies <laughs> they've produced or if you feel like I love everything they've done or what they're doing and I feel like they'll respond because that's the kind of stuff I respond to. That helps you, you know. Well, let's do, like, on, on the last panel, someone said, okay, it, things are becoming more niche, and, you know, the networks have different brands. Can one of you um, go really quickly, you know, give, give out the secret? What are the different brands that the networks have now? Or is it, do you think it's really irrelevant? No, I think every network has a, has a personality. And I think, you know, as we're seeing this market shrink, it's become much, much more niche. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think the broadcast networks, I think they, they really can't call themselves broadcast. So can we go longer. through, like, okay, CBS? Well? More traditional, older demographic. I mean, they've had the most traditional um, um, pilot season this year to the extent of everybody else has mixed things up by shooting pilots, um, announcing their schedule early, like NBC. ABC is going to shoot pilots this summer. There's a big discussion on what will happen next year. We'll... They go back to the, the original way. Um, but CBS is, you know, done. They shot their nine pilots in drama. They picked up four. They're, um, they're safe. I mean, they're, right. as far as the style of their the brand, right. like the brand, it's conservative. Right. It's pretty safe. Right. They don't take many risks. Okay, how about um, NBC? Well, NBC is an interesting thing. NBC is, 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 moving, is moving quickly yeah. um, because it's very fluid. You know, Ben Silverman's in there for the last year and a half, and he comes from a known for doing formats and right. um, option formats and, and whether it be in scripted and Ugly Betty or whether it be uh, British in terms of The Office and then doing reality. So, you know, Ben is looking to, you know, bring an outside finance and it's a different model, but you know. Mind, but light entertainment, of, but I'm doing a pilot that's a romantic comedy anthology for NBC. I don't see how it fits in at all, mm -hmm. but then I have sort of a fantasy that, well, then this could be there, you know, yes. the way Desperate Housewives sort of anchored. Yeah, that's right. NBC. That's right, and they're doing. A, I think they're also doing. They're doing an anthology yeah, called Fair Itself. Well, that's a for, different format. Right. Nobody's done anthology for a long time. No, I think it's. I think it's okay. Sometimes you feel like, well, maybe this will be. I don't know. That's probably not the best marketing idea, but, but ABC. ABC. Well, ABC has female leads on their show, unlike heavy, CBS. Heavy, heavy. Want many right. more, and they right. and they also go to a much more. You know, women in, are actually in their 30s, and some are in their 40s on ABC. And you've got your Grey's Anatomy, and you've got your Desperate Housewives, and you've got Private Practice, and so it's a it's a more uh, and Brothers and Sisters. These are much more female directed. They're trying shows. to broaden that now. I think they're trying yeah. to, to broaden that, and I think they're also, um, you know, they've done the last year. They've been trying to do things that have a lot of humor in their one hours. You know, they're trying to. They're I don't lighter say, than CBS. Lighter, yes, yeah. much not less less procedural. 
Right. And also, uh, their schedule skewed very heavily towards sort of serialized dramas, mm -hmm. which I think during the strike, you know, I, I think they were hit a little bit harder than some of the other networks because um, serialized dramas uh, don't repeat as well. And so I think now you may see a trend from what you're seeing on the air to what they're going to pick up this year, and maybe they'll put in a cop show or two because those repeat really right. well. And could you go through a couple of the cable networks in terms of brands? Well, USA is, you know, um, what happens is, is I think the brands sort of like, they aren't from the start. Maybe they're, they're, they're trying to figure out from the start, but usually what happens is they have a hit show, and that helps drive or expand the brand. So like, you know, on USA, Monk, okay, we need a companion piece. So it's a light one hour. I think it was even up for, was it up for comedies? Or, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it, was, it was, you know, one of those sort of like, you know. Hybrids. Hybrids, thank you. Um, and so, you know, they try to go companion piece. They, they have the show called Psych. So everything they're doing is going to have, you know, a little bit lighter in their step. You know, in and terms you're of doing a couple of things on Showtime. What, what yeah. would you say their brand is? Um, Showtime is, um, you know, when you get into premium cable, um, it's really about being a little bit subversive. It's about being noisy. Um, it's about a concept that is going to get a lot of attention. Um, that you couldn't do elsewhere. There's absolutely something about right. the show that you think right. absolutely, couldn't do absolutely right. provocative. Yeah. Something That's that right. they feel that they're going to. That's right. um, you know, not just from a you know, language point of view or graphic or sexual, but just from a storytelling point of view. You're going to be able to go into a world with characters that you're not going to see. There's sort of like there's basic cable, and as basic cable moves closer to premium cable, you've got like FX, which is like sort of like on the edge. And I guess AMC is trying to go there where they're trying to do stuff that is, you know, cl aggressive basic cable programming and then moving into, you know. Yeah, AMC is very novelistic. I mean, they're really about taking their time telling stories. So if you look at Mad Men or Breaking Bad, it's really about creating a novel, if you will. So it's really serialized. Um, it's interesting because I think a lot of the networks, like TNT we're hearing, are completely going into the procedural world now. Well, they are. We <clears throat> we just had a show we just got picked up, which I think is going to, um, if it works out, thanks, um, could expand their brand. Um, but it's, 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 I think it's going to be, I kind of think part of it is serendipitous in the sense of yeah. they happen to have a pilot they love, a script they love, they shot it. I don't think they sat there and go, well, we, how can we expand our brand? But this show is a, a show called Truth and Advertising, and it's essentially been referred to as contemporary Mad Men. It's, it's basically meant to be very sort of you know light, breezy. They've hired Nancy's, and there's three writers on the show plus the showrunners, and three of the four writers are with you guys. And, and but, but two of the writers they hired are like showrunners from the comedy world. So it's, it's really trying to... You know, um, you know, come out of the um, um, the comedic world. You know, against an advertising situation as well. And is there a sense of what HBO is looking for now? Is well, I almost I don't know. I shouldn't say, but I feel like it's almost Showtime. It's sort of what HBO. Mm -hmm. I think HBO is a little confusing now. But for a long time, their slogan was, "It's not TV, it's HBO." And right. to develop for them, it had to be something that you couldn't do elsewhere that was darker. When you develop for them, they would a lot of times say, go deeper, darker, which isn't a note you get from ABC or TV answer <laughs> that often. So it was kind of like do something that really get under it. And it was a place to do your passion project, maybe as a writer, maybe you wouldn't pay as much, but would be something that you could really do right, no commercials to interrupt it. And that idea of writing a pilot, like with Showtime, where you get 30 minutes with no commercials is kind of a great luxury for a writer. And Margaret, you have the same last name as the new head uh, of HBO, yeah, yeah, yeah. at HBO. Do you have any insight into what they're looking for now? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I, I have something I have to go pitch to her that is actually something that I had told her as an agent that I really wanted to do, and I ended up not doing, and so she called up and said, we'll take that. We want that. So now I'm just trying to, you know, I, I'm like, I'm freaking out about it. So anyway, because I have so much work to do. Uh, anyway, so, but I don't have a sense of what they want. I keep going, I'd feel so much safer if I was going to Showtime because I know exactly what they want. They want what HBO used to want. Right. And they're t actually doing it, whereas I don't know exactly what HBO wants. And she wrote well, the tone of the one that they, they want from you. Oh, it's so not HBO, so I'm sort of freaked out. It's, it could be on ABC as well. It could totally well, be on the ABC. Thing, the networks are kind of upping their game, especially in drama. So I feel like my best show for a network, yeah, Swingtown, and that would have been on it. You would think that'd be HBO. <laughs> yeah. there's, but there's in a way, thing. that's good. Like I feel like my best writing for a network when I'm doing a pilot is I think, how would I do it for HBO, and then let them pull you tell back, me, pull me back, but try to do it as edgy as. I can. Now I know we're at our time limit, um, but can we go up a few minutes?
over? We have so many questions. And Nancy, did you want to say something? Uh, no, the only well, the only thing I wanted to say about the pay count, the pay stations like HBO and Showtime, which is different than the networks, is like if Ugly Betty works on ABC, ABC will probably look for you. You know, it's common wisdom to say like uh, look for you know comedic, female-driven things. But on HBO and Showtime, since they're pay cables, they don't care if you watch a lot of shows or one show. What they care about is that you're subscribing to their channel. So when Sex and the City was on, people may have thought, wow, I should pitch you know this, you know funny female skewing. You know, whatever sort of was the definition of that demographic, but it was actually really do not do that because recovery. those people are already subscribing. <laughs> yes. Hello. Um, guess my question is, how do you rein it in? And by that I mean, realistically, I, I well, I consider myself realistically ambitious. Love to work in film. Love to work. Um, and television and keeping my eye on new media because that's where uh, the industry seems to be going. But am I casting the net too wide? Should I be focused on one specific area or should I keep my, you know, the net as is? Well, I- I'm someone who's done a lot of different things. And so um, and they're, they're always like, what? Um, UTA, so I was like, what? You know, because I was writing a musical last year, and, and you know, I just said, oh, I'm writing a musical. Oh, okay. So I don't, I, you know, it's easier if you just do one thing. It is easier for you. It's, I, I, I think, I mean, I think it's easier to, to sell you, to brand you, to, if, if there's one thing. But then I've seen friends who've, you know, just been so fed up with TV, and they turn around and write that movie script, spec script, and suddenly they're writing movies. And everything that they learned in TV comes in to movies and makes their movie very special. Just like, you know, you can write features and then you turn around to TV and and that feature thing makes that movie writing special. For example, I was pitching to, it's interesting, I was pitching to this director who's got a a movie director who's now got a big TV deal and he's got someone running it who's from a network. So this person from a network has now gone to this other place and I pitched this idea that's very out there. And the movie half of it's going, this is great for TV. This is so out there. And the network half, who's now become a creative, is going, no, 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 you can't sell it. You can't sell it. No, 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 no. And I turned to the network and I said, you're in a creative position now. You're in the what if. Now, so you kind of have to, I guess what I'm saying is that you have to keep yourself really open to what you want to do, but I think it is better to pick a genre. I think I, you're, I mean. I would, what I would do um, is, um, and again, i my, I have some clients who, it's, you know, they've done the opposite and it's worked terribly well for them. But I think that you got to back up and you got to go, what are my goals in the next, you know, you got to kind of like compartmentalize the next year or two and go, okay, let's say in the next 12 months, where do I want to be? And if you really want to be, for example, on staff in the show, I'd, I'd back up and I'd go, okay, what can I accomplish in that period of time? What's going to serve me best? And if you can write, you know, if you're writing one feature in that period of time, it's going to be, tricky because it depends on the kind of feature you write, who's going to read it, you know, does it line up with what's on the air, is it going to make sense, it's going to help market you, so it's like, if you really want to be on staff, you want to focus on that, then it's like, okay, what do I write for TV, do I write two specs, do I write a spec, do I write an original, do I write both, do I write a play, do I write a short story, whatever it might be, but I think you got to really kind of make a decision, it doesn't mean you can't change your mind along the way at some point, but then you have to like, you know, have some short term goals, and I would really get focused on it, that's what I would do. Another couple of questions. Um, yes. Um, this is for Margaret. I'm also a SAG after actress, but I'm working on developing my writing. Did you have an easier time using your own acting agents to get you to a literary agent, oh, or did you have no. to start from no, scratch no, completely? No, 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 no. no. Uh-uh. Start from scratch completely. Knowing absolutely no one, and they weren't able to help you in any way. Maneuver you. You weren't you weren't with UTA for acting, and they can move you to literary. Mm-mm. Well, were uh, you listening when Elizabeth pointed out that everyone will disappoint you? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's funny now. There's an agent at CAA who who wanted to sign me in New York when he was at William Morris, and he's like, "You should." And now he's working with me as a you know, but and I'm working with his clients, you know, on a project. But and then it, I was represented as an actress by um, uh, Brad Gray by the pet sisters there, and they're just, I came in for something for one of their clients, they're like, what the hell happened to you? You know, you can't, I don't think as an actress, you know, 
Unless you're Robert Downey Jr. and you want to direct a movie, but yes. You. Um, I wanted to ask um, Nancy and Larry about um, new new clients. Was it my my train of thought? What I'm I'm getting from the whole day is that you need to sort of like find work to get an agent manager. Is that kind of kind of the way it you know you kind of have to go hustle, get a job, and then no. you guys come knocking. Write something good. I I don't agree at all. I mean, I've never gone after anybody who's I mean, had a job. Usually, if they have a job, usually they're probably represented. Or we're going after people we're developing early on. So we'll read early on that's what we do so absolutely not because i've given this advice and i don't know if it's true but i'll ask you guys are there like junior people at, at, who are more likely to read something that comes in blind to the agent what happens to scripts that come in blind to the agent i think it depends what right? <laughs> oh yeah um, so somebody reads them all uh or no not necessarily. actually um we we are prohibited from reading unsolicited manuscripts. So when you send those letters and you're like, screw them, they sent me back this letter. We have a woman, you know, for liability reasons, look, if a script shows up unasked for, um, we have to send it back. But you can have an attorney send it. You don't but have to if, have yeah, it. if there's somebody that we're doing business with or, you know, especially as Larry right. said, a client that sends it in or an executive that we trust that sends it in. You know, a lot of times people, um, for brand new writers who haven't had their first, like, job as a writer, you know, the writer's assistant route is, is a great way because you're interacting with agents and managers all over town and building relationships. And, you know, I'll always read the scripts from writer's assistants that I've been dealing with. Um, but if it's just, you know, I mean, there's a certain, you know, unfortunately, there's a certain, like, time management issue in um, the amount of unsolicited, you know, uh, approaches that we have. And, you know, I think smaller agencies or younger agents may be hungrier, you know, just to sort of read a cool letter and, and move on it. But generally, it has to, we have to have some sort of interaction with the person. Right. Angela, can we take a couple more questions? One more? One more, okay. I'll give it a theme of influences, my question. And um, touch on it a little bit, but what's the influence of the net in terms of finding new projects and writers to develop, as well as the influence of the potential strike um, in this day and age, so the current environment? And also to, sorry, to, to Elizabeth as well, what type of influences the success of Brotherhood have on the projects that you now do take on? and what you're looking for uh, for new projects from new writers. Anybody want to talk about the business? <laughs> the state of the business? Are you finding things off the internet? Well, um, are, you, are you saying in terms of um, marketing um, our clients for the net and, 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 and to help them build their careers in that business? No, finding finding new writers from the internet. Cause I, oh, right, and finding new writers yeah, from the exactly, internet. Yeah, exactly. I developed an idea for the right. internet um, only because it was during the strike right. for a half-hour sitcom. My gut told me to do it at that time, and now I'm kind of thinking, well, gee, I really should really work on I, the pilot or, or back a backdoor pilot script as well. I mean, I, I, think my, I think it's very, very viable. I mean, we've done some um, sort of, um, you know, you know, you know, work with people, um, you know, coming out of the internet, but it's been, like, at the end of the day, we have, you know, so much time, and we sort of have our own sort of traditional places where we have relationships, where we all have built sort of businesses, and and so it's only like, it's a matter of really like, part of it's like time, how, how much time can we allocate to looking on the internet? I mean, I think it's very, very viable. I think it's very, very viable. I think there's going to be some, some interesting people that, um, you know, come out of that area for sure, but I've always been very bullish on you know, young voices and new voices coming out of different places. I think that it's just you have to be very specific on can somebody make the transition. You should write your script, though. I mean, if you're thinking about doing it, because if we find something off the internet, um, the next question is, can, can we read something? You know, um, and we're actually working on micro series now, where we're doing two minute movies, um, but we're working with writers who have written scripts that we've read, you know. And, and the other thing I'll say is we always ask for two original samples. So, um, you know, keep writing because, w again, we're looking, we're not staffing right now. We're looking for voices so that we can help you create a show. 
Um, and so it's all about about voices. And as far as brotherhood, I mean, brotherhood became a calling card for us, just like you having a script that has your voice. I mean, it, it you know, we just actually put this version of Mandalay Television together in the last year. And so having brotherhood was nice because there's a really good story behind it and what we actually did to help get it um, on the air. And, um, and also, um, you know, the quality of it because it's a really well-written show. Um, so it was it was a nice calling card for us, but we have to move on now. You know what I mean? We can't rely on that forever. Well, sadly, we have to move on as well. <laughs> and um, I think you know.